the land management is not the solution to reducing emissions, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The people of the landscape, we should not think of them as anthropological subjects. The view from the sky doesn't tell you a lot. You really have to get down to the ground. I was working in Brazil on using satellite data to map deforestation. This was in the early 2000s when deforestation was very, very high in Brazil. And I was working with the Brazilian Space Agency on um, very technical work on improving their algorithms to map deforestation uh, in real time. And, uh, and that took me to the ground there. And the deforestation that is occurring in the in the southern part of the Amazon is is uh, just so large scale. It's clearing for uh, for soy and for pasture, huge, huge scale. It's like um, it's like Iowa or Kansas. It's just huge fields and deforestation occurring very rapidly with tractors and chains between the tractors just running down all the all the trees so it's very very different than you have here where there's you know, small scale very small land holding small fields you don't have that kind of massive deforestation so the um, the Brazil mapping deforestation really wasn't much of a remote sensing challenge <laughs> because it's so easy to see because it's so massive here it's very hard to um let me say this right that um the remote sen the view from the sky doesn't tell you a lot you really have to get down to the ground because the um because the processes are so small scale so now monitoring deforestation from satellite is very standard yeah, very yeah. established methods forest and standard. Survey of India before. Yeah, exactly. Actually, the Forest um, Survey of India is one of the well, India is one of the countries that has been monitoring forests with satellites for for a long time, for decades now. Um, really, one of the leaders in using satellite data for monitoring forests. Um, but the the use of satellite data has become so much beyond. You know, just mapping deforestation, now you can see the structure of the vegetation and um, over time and higher and higher resolution. So you could see a lot, a lot more than when I started out <laughs> um, from remote sensing, but there's so much you can't see. You can't see the processes on the ground, the drivers, why deforestation is happening. Um, even the very small kind of patchy that's still hard to see um, and you there's no way you can understand um, the interaction between people and the forest um, from from above in the places that are the frontier forests like the Amazon and Southeast Asia and Indonesia where the deforestation is around commod big commodities and exports like oil palm in Southeast Asia or beef and um, and soy in the Amazon that's a very very different driver that's where you have that kind of massive uh, deforestation that takes a lot of investment and um, highly valuable commodities like oil palm is so lucrative um, that you can understand why that deforestation happens um, as opposed to here where the deforestation is just so different you know smaller scale you might see some encroachment of agricultural fields or clearing for projects like um, highways um, and it's just such a different set of drivers that I cannot say that there is a trend in the whole global south and also Africa different set of drivers so I think that's one of the things we really have to keep in mind when we have these big goals about reducing deforestation is that there isn't one driver and different places, there's such a different context in different places.
So the changes that we've seen are just phenomenal in the um, in this time period. You know, some good, some bad. Some people would think some things are good or bad, and other pe people would see the same things are are in the other way. For example, when I first started out doing um, an on-the-ground research project here, it was about the expansion of um, tourism. So tourism was really, really taking off. And the infrastructure around the protected areas, you could very much see it with the resorts coming up and all of the infrastructure around tourism, which is both good and bad, is wonderful. That, um, that people can appreciate their biological heritage. For the park itself <laughs> and the connectivity, maybe not so wonderful. But also changes in, which is probably a positive thing, changes in, um, in the rural roads, that um, the scheme to pave the rural roads, that made a big change in the landscape. Um, people having phones, um, you know, the connectedness of people who were previously more remote. It's just massive, you know, really big changes, not to mention all the highways and uh, infrastructure expansion. Like a lot of us, um, I started from the point of view of conservation and wildlife, and this is Central India is such a globally important tiger conservation area so that was my entry point but like a lot of people who came from that um, that entry point you realize that the people and the communities are so integrated in the landscape that more and more the work turns towards the social aspects and the interaction between people and forests and wildlife I agree very much with the point that the um, the people of the landscape, we should not think of them as anthropological subjects or people that should be kept in, in the forest or with their traditional way of, of life if they have different aspirations. Yeah, so to me, you know, if there could be a vision, it would be that, um, that people have the ability and the options to meet their aspirations, whether that is remaining um, being forest dependent or whether that's that's moving out or whatever their aspirations are, if that people are able to meet what they, whatever lifestyle they aspire. Like we all, like, like everyone else. <laughs>I think what we're seeing now is the success of tiger conservation, the increasing numbers and the increasing conflict. Mm -hmm. So it's that one success is, leads to another problem. So that is really a major, major issue that, um, as, we, as everyone was saying, is uh, ha have to address, have to address, um, because you can't have, have people being killed and children not able to walk to school. That just is not, not a good outcome. <laughs> um, and also I think we're learning that we might th think we know where wildlife needs to go, but wildlife itself, they are so adaptive and learn and seeing more and more movement through agricultural areas and even urban areas that there's no, you know, no, uh, no finishing point to understanding connectivity because the movement is is dynamic as well so it's a scientist's dream is to be able to have research that actually makes a difference which is harder to achieve than it seems you know it's not that you could say that one bit of research leads to a policy change or some big breakthrough. It's just incrementally contributing to an area that then maybe <laughs> has gets some attention. So it's not one scientist alone or one piece of research alone. It's just being part of the whole conversation about an issue. The recognition of the importance of connectivity and the amazing achievement to have the uh, mitigation structures 
when you come across the Kano Pench Quarter on the Pench side, the longest overpass for cars, for vehicles in the world. I mean, that was just amazing to watch that. And that was the hard work of so many people, you know, fighting, um, you know, raising the legal issues and making that happen. I can't claim, you know, we contributed to that body of knowledge in some research, but I can't claim that our particular piece of research is what made the difference. about land use as being the integrator of how hum humans interact with the natural world. Terrestrial, I know there's a whole a whole part of the world that is um, that is the ocean. Most of the world is the ocean, but people are mostly on the, in the uh, in the terrestrial part. So I see it as just the integrator. So um, land use has so many. So the economic um, benefits of land use change and the um, social changes that come with land use change and how people interact in their space and then the ecological side of it the impact on habitats the um, uh, hydrology the impact on water the impact on carbon all of the impacts of land use change on ecosystem services so i've always thought about land use as just the integrator of the way that people interact with um, right. with nature okay. the land management is not the solution to reducing emissions, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You know, the major contributor is the energy sector. So um, I think there's been a bit of hype about how much so-called nature-based solutions can actually contribute to solving the climate problem, if there is a solution, um, but certainly can contribute. Then you get back to the aspects of land use that are, um, that are so important for people from an economic and food security point of view. And why it's so tricky is because we could store carbon and it'll make all this forest again, but people need to eat, people need to live somewhere. So how do you, how do you create a system where something like the carbon market can um, achieve the benefits but not um, displace people or not be harmful for what people need for their livelihoods and food security. I think there's some potential for agroforestry, for, uh, for planting trees uh, outside the protected areas that are and on private lands where people could benefit. They could benefit from, uh, from fruits and, um, and also benefit from the um, improvement in hydrology. Um, so that agroforestry kind of approach mm -hmm. seems like it could be a promising way forward for this part of the landscape that's not going to solve the climate problem, but could contribute and could be uh, beneficial for people as well. And the, the, those solutions, if there are solutions, um, I don't see how they could work unless people benefit, either economically or through their livelihoods or through their uh, something that they can recognize as a tangible benefit.